So now um, we move into uh, Peter's lecture. Um, Peter Tyler is, of course, Professor of Pastoral Theology and Spirituality at St. Mary's University, Twickenham, London. He's also in psychotherapeutic practice. Um, several of us know his books, his magnificent book, The Pursuit of the Soul, which bridges psychology and theology, and his book on confession I read just recently, um, which was so helpful because often therapy and confession have been divorced. Um, but he brings them back together, really brings back that connection, which is so needed. His most recent book is Christian Mindfulness, Theology and Practice. And I haven't read it yet, but I very much look forward to doing so. And personally, of course, I'm especially grateful to Peter because he's hosted us the past two years at St. Mary's University Twickenham. Um, but I mean, Peter is the most magnificent host. I have this abiding image of his disappearing for a while. And then at lunchtime, the double doors opened and there was this cheery face and behind him a magnificent buffet. But the downside of all this is, and Peter was so, such a great host, that he never actually gave a lecture. So today at last, the Friends of Sophia is going to hear Peter. And you've brought some rich material for us uh, from Hopkins, from Chenu, and from Edith Stein. So I think we're, of course, Edith Stein from the Carmelite tradition, linking back to Julian and, and uh, the other, the big Teresa. So we very much look forward to hearing you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tommy. Do I have the share screen capacity open to me? Uh, yes, I think you do. It should be in the bottom green uh, button. Okay, I've pressed it. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Excellent. Great. Can you all see it? Yeah. Then Good. You haven't seen Hopkins. No, it's, I'm getting... It's a multiple screen, is that right? Yeah. You should see the, the Zoom PowerPoint. screen in a kind of column in the corner, and then there's a PowerPoint, yeah, with Hopkins. Uh -huh. Can everyone see Hopkins? Good. Okay. Yeah. Well, this, this is the first time I've had 60 people in my study, so uh, I never knew I could do it. So it's, it's great to have you all here, and it's great, I'm greatly honoured to be asked to, to participate in this wonderful day. Um, just a few words to say before I give the paper. Um, the paper sounds like a bit of a religious joke, really. There was once a Jesuit, a Dominican and a Carmelite. <laughs> not. Um, and it was really inspired by Father Dominic's invitation to go out of the silo. To, that I think this is the original intention of Friends of Sophia, especially in the academic world. We're all in our silos of theology and philosophy and, and music and so on and so forth. And I think um, Father Dominic's invitation was an open invitation for us all to go out of our silos. And my silo is, is pastoral theology, as, as Dominic's just been saying. And over the lockdown, um, I was going to do this anyway, and it's fortuitous that it happened. I've been working on a book on Edith Stein, a remarkable woman. And so she is an obvious um, person, as it were, to start the conversation. Um, but I, for a long time now, for many, many, many years, longer than I care to remember, I have always been fascinated by the poetry of Gerald Manley Hopkins. Um, and I have to give a health warning, really, especially to those amongst you who are literary scholars or literary critics. I'm not. I'm not a literary scholar at all. So I'm a, a complete amateur when it comes to literary scholarship. But I've taken Father Dominic's uh, invitation to heart and I'm using this opportunity to, as it were, engage with someone I love, which is Hopkins and his poetry. Um, but this is a private meeting amongst friends, so I hope you'll indulge me in that respect. So that's the Jesuit, that's the Carmelite and the Jesuit. And um, the Dominican, as you would expect, uh, Chenou, Marie Dominique Chenou, is the one who brings the intellectual heft to all this. 
Um, and he is again a figure who I've long been fascinated by and uh, I really wanted an excuse to go into his works. So that's really um, what I'm going to be doing. For those of you who want to go and have a meditation or go and do a bit of gardening now it's raining or have a little sleep, um, I can basically tell you what the paper is in, in, in two minutes. And really what I'm going to do in this time is I'm going to follow Shenu and Stein, who themselves are following Dionysius the Areopagite, who himself is in the Platonic tradition, which we started with, with Douglas this morning. And from these, this lineage, I'm developing this idea of the symbolic. Now, I've written on my synopsis there, um, and I wrote this synopsis unusually for me months ago before COVID was a, a twinkle in a microbiologist's eye. And uh, what I've written there is how do we find divine harmony, which is the theme of today, in the disharmony of the world around us? So we've had so far today a lot of harmony and the wondrous music of the spheres and so on. I'm talking about disharmony. Uh, I'm talking about the, the breakdown, as it were, and the dark side. And um, as I say, when I wrote this paper, perhaps I had a premonition, I had no idea that I'd be delivering it in my living room in, this, in these circumstances. And my answer to that question uh, from a Christian perspective, and that's what I'm presenting here, is that the answer is essentially symbolic. And so what I will do in this time, I shall present the, uh, what I understand by the Christian understanding of the symbolic, and then I'll apply it to the circumstances within which we find ourselves today. And throughout that, I'm going to intersperse the poetry of Hopkins. I'm not, as well as not being a literary scholar, I'm not an actor, and unlike Valentin, who was, Shakespeare was brilliant earlier. Um, but I am going to try and read uh, portions from the wreck of the Deutschland, which is really the, the theme of the whole day. And um, Hopkins is extremely difficult to read. Um, someone very kindly sent me an old recording uh, by a, quite a, a fruity thespian in the middle of the 20th century. And um, you really have to work hard to, to read Hopkins. So I'm gonna do my best. It's not, it's not going to be a professional rendition. So that's the uh, menu. And here is the, the meal. So I'd like to begin with the first stanza of the wreck of the Deutschland. Thou, mastering me, God, giver of breath and bread, world strand, sway of the sea, lord of living and dead, thou hast bound bones and veins in me, fastened me flesh, and after it almost unmade what with dread, thy doing, and dost thou touch me afresh. Over again, I feel thy finger and find thee. The circumstances surrounding the writing of one of Hopkins' greatest poems, if not one of the greatest pieces of 19th century English literature, are almost too well known to be reiterated again. Yet, as with the beginnings of John of the Cross's poetic career in the dungeons of Toledo or St. Teresa of Avila's whilst recovering from a life-threatening illness, it is worth recalling these circumstances so as to give us an insight into the underlying theme or the colour of the work. Hopkins, as an undergraduate, was lucky enough to have studied in another place, not Cambridge, in Oxford in the 1860s. And there he came under the influence of some of the greatest philosophical and aesthetic minds of the century. Amongst them, John Henry Newman, Coventry Patmore, Robert Bridges, and Benjamin Jowett. All of them could be listed as his confidants, advisors, and mentors. 
At this time, he himself showed great promise as a poet and literary scholar. But after his conversion to Roman Catholicism in 1866, and subsequent entrance into the Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, in 1868, he abruptly decided to burn all his early poetry in an oblation he called in his diary, the slaughter of the innocents. For the following seven years, he placed, him, placed himself upon, under the discipline of Ignatius Loyola, inwardly determining only to write again should his gifts be required for the greater glory of God. In 1875, whilst at the Jesuit Theologate at St. Bino's on what he called a pastoral forehead of Wales, he finally received the permission he'd been waiting for to write again. The Jesuit community read with shock and awe the terrible stories of the drowning of 60 passengers on the German ship, the Deutschland, as she foundered off the Kent coast during a terrible storm between the 6th and 7th of December, 1875. This is a, an illustration from one of the uh, newspapers of the day. Uh, it's a sort of the sun of the time, you know, the shock, shock horror. It was a terrible event. Amongst the passengers were five Franciscan tertiaries, driven from Germany by the folklores of Bismarck, all of whom drowned in the, the shipwreck. Mothers Barbara Holtenschmidt, Norbetta Reinkorper, Orea Batsura, Brigitte Damhorst, and Henrika Fassbinder. One of them, the tall nun, was heard to cry before she perished, Mein Gott, mach es schnell mit uns, God, come quickly. Poignantly for Hopkins, they were finally laid to rest near his childhood home at St. Patrick's Cemetery in Leytonstow in East London. Whilst discussing the incident with his rector at St. Bino's, Father Jones, the priest opined that he wished someone would write a poem on the subject. This was all Hopkins needed to rekindle his writing career, and within a few weeks, the dam burst. What he'd been waiting for all those years happened. And he produced the great ode, The Wreck of the Deutschland, of 35 verses. Bridges, who ed later edited his poetry, called it the great dragon that guards the entrance to his work. Unique untranslatable and possibly one of the most misunderstood religious poems in the English language, I want to draw upon the wreck as illustrative of the theme this paper will explore this afternoon, the role of the symbolic in the Christian contribution to the wisdom tradition, and how by living and acting through the symbol, as well as seeing and thinking about it, we actually enter into the Christian Paschal mystery of death and resurrection, not only on the deepest personal level, but also something that's been implied uh, so far in this conference on a cosmic level. And that I would like to contend here is for me anyway, the essential message of Hopkins' masterpiece. To begin with then, let's have a look at this word, the symbol, this weasel word, the symbolic. And here, as I say, I'm helped by the great uh, French Dominican Marie Dominique Chenou. Here you see him in action. And Chenou explores in great depth how the sim, what he calls the symbolic mentality, came to characterize the uniquely medieval, or you probably better say, pre modern perspective on creation. The term symbol from the Greek literally means that which throws together symbaleng. And it has been associated with Christianity and Christians since its early days. In 250, for example, St. Cyprian of Carthage, commenting on its manifestation in the Apostles' Creed, remarks that it is the mark that distinguishes the Christians from the pagans. 
if we follow Chenu's uh, logic or argument, the symbolic is for the medievals that which was to, to be distinguished from the dialectic. It was not considered another form of logic, so it wasn't another logic, it was another way of showing truth. So you show truth through dialectic in the schools and you show truth through the symbolic. Here are some quotes from uh, Chenu's wonderful book, Nature, Man and Society in the 12th century, published in 1957 and republished um, seven years ago. To bring symbolism into play was not to extend or supplement a previous act of the reason. It was to give primary expression to a reality which reason could not attain and which reason even afterwards could not conceptualize. In this respect, Chenu contrasts the earlier psychologization of Augustine's approach with the non-reducible symbolic of Dionysius, making here a distinction between the signs of Augustine and the symbols of Dionysius, even though both streams would continually interact with each other throughout the medieval period and even into the early modern period. In this respect, he characterizes the medieval period as being dominated as much by the symbolic as the dialectic. In the whole range of its culture, the medieval period was an era of the symbol. Drawing upon the works of Alan of Lille, the various Arthurian romances, he's, he's a very expansive thinker, philosophical commentaries, liturgical texts, biblical exegesis, and pastoral letters. Chenu presents not only a medieval guide to the symbolic mentality, but even a series of laws that guided that mentality. He characterizes, sorry, he characterizes it as a permeating influence of which people were more or less aware upon their ways and turns of thought, a caste or coloration given to even the commonest of notions. Thus, the writers and exegetes of in particular the 12th century carried a universal conviction that all natural or historical reality possessed a significance which transcended its crude reality and which a certain symbolic dimension of that reality would reveal to man's mind. The symbol was thus the true and proper expression of reality and through it reality revealed itself. This, I would contend, is the use and the power of the symbol in Hopkins' poem. By entering symbolically into the suffering of the doomstruck passengers of the Deutschland, we do in fact enter into reality itself. What form this reality takes, we shall return to at the end of the paper. So let's look at Chenu's laws of symbolism. I love this idea, the idea of laws of symbolism. The primary law, he states thus, to join two realities within a single symbol was to put the mind into secret contact with transcendent reality, not without a sense of inward exaltation, something I think we've already mentioned on the conference so far, and certainly with an affective response that inspired poetic creativity. Quoting John of Salisbury, Chenu reminds us, now you've, you've paid a lot for this conference, so we'll have a bit of Latin uh, to make it worth your while. Vera latent rerum variorum tecta figuris, nam sacra vulgari publica jura vetant. Truths lie covered by the figures of various things, for public laws forbid sacred things to the crowd. 
the laws of the symbolic must lie secret and hidden. They must be earned. We must look for them carefully. We must sit at the feet of masters so that the sacred truths will eventually be revealed. Only then will the exaltation of the poetic moment provoke an effective response. This, of course, is something unacceptable, heretical to our modern ears, the idea of uh, secret truths. Everything has to be open. One could go further and highlight the role of Eros, so important to Dionysius in this response too. The symbolic, no less than the aesthetic moment, may contain within itself an intrinsic trace left by the encounter with the Eros of God. That's certainly the case in Hopkins' poetry. The second law is probably even more mysterious and gnomic than the first law. Um, I don't expect you to, to take all this in one go. It's taken me years to, to get to grips with some of this stuff. And this is stated thus. The crudest symbols are seen as those most capable of signifying the mystery. This is important. And again, uh, Valentin mentioned this morning about paradox. Paradox being the door, if you like, into the world, into the secret of the world. And uh, you see that very clearly in this, this second law. He writes, the more gross the material, the more it induced the anagogic leap as against the peril of anthropomorphism that was nurtured by symbols too closely resembling the thing they symbolized. Why should this be so? Shenu, of course, supplies the answer. The symbolic value emerges only in proportion to the rays retaining its integrity whilst functioning as signal. If we turn material reality into nothing but a figure, so if material reality, that worship of the goddess that Douglas told us about earlier, if that material reality uh, becomes nothing, it's just a, a signpost towards the divine, then it's a sort of form of manichaeism. It's a form of dualism where the material world has no significance whatsoever. This is clear in Hopkins' poem, where for all his eulogy to the symbolism of the snow and the storm, there is no getting around the fact that they will destroy vulnerable human beings in the most cruel way possible. The seaman garroted by a rope, the nuns gasping for life and breath as the waters rise around them. Christianity, Hopkins reminds us, despite its acquired tendency to transcendence, must never forget its historical roots in the grit and grime, the blood and sweat of first century Palestine, of which he reminds us often in the poem. Chenu thus calls the type of symbolism propounded by Dionysius, Alan of Lille and their followers as a realist symbolism where symbolic action is a normal part of the dynamism of a cosmos, reaching upwards towards God in hierarchical stages. Such realist symbolism would thus come to embrace all actions in a person's life, from the most mundane to the most exalted. We shall return to this shortly. I'd like now to move to a second one though. I'd like now to move to our second uh, conversation partner. This is uh, Edith Stein, person I introduced at the moment, at the beginning. This is her, the last known photograph of her. It's an extremely beautiful photograph. Uh, she needed a passport to get out of Nazi Germany. Um, she was actually trying to get to Switzerland. Um, her, her habit was so uh, well used. She had to borrow uh, one of the other sister's habits for the photograph. And this is her passport photograph that she used to try and escape 
Nazi Germany. Sadly, um, she wasn't able to. So another fascinating and misunderstood writer, Edith Stein, Theresia Benedicta Acruce. Appro appropriately enough, in the light of the discussion we're having this afternoon, the last academic paper she wrote before her death in the Nazi extermination camp of Auschwitz was on the symbolic in Dionysius. In 1940, Professor Marvin Farber, one of Edith's old circle of Göttingen phenomenologists, who had been driven out of Germany by the anti-Semitic policies of the Nazis, wrote to Stein at a convent in Echt in Holland, asking for a contribution to the newly created Journal of Philosophy and Phenomenological Research. The result was the article we now know as Ways to Know God, the Symbolic Theology of Dionysius the Areopagite and its Objective Presupposition. Even though it wasn't uh, published in her lifetime, the, the academic journal didn't uh, want to publish it. It is her last uh, academic article. And when she was taken by the Nazis, by the Gestapo, she was working on her last piece, The Science of the Cross, which she tells us has a great deal of uh, interconnection with her ideas on Dionysius. So what you get here in this article is very much an insight into her final thought. Stein, like Chenu, begins her discussion in the article by noting that part of our problem with accepting the symbolic perspective lies in the ambiguity hidden within the term theology itself. She interprets Dionys Dionysius, on whom her article is based, as not seeing theology as a science or systematic doctrine about God, but rather as Holy Scripture, God's word, literally, theo theos logos. And those who speak this word, the sacred writers, she says, are the theologians. That is, people who speak of God because God has taken hold of them. Very good uh, definition, I think, of a theologian. I'll repeat that. People who speak of God because God has taken hold of them. In this respect, then, Christ, we've, we've had a few comments on the conference so far that we haven't had much Christ so far, so I'm going to redress that balance in this paper. Christ for Stein becomes the highest of the theologians, the first theologian. She calls him the Ur-theolog. Thus, different theologies become different ways of speaking about God or ways of knowing God. Accordingly, what we are speaking of in this paper is thus on the threshold of the deepest mysteries of human existence. For, as Stein writes, the higher the knowledge, the darker and more mysterious it is, the less it can be put into words. The symbol then is a build, a picture that holds all together, light and dark, evil and holiness, love and hate. Here Stein takes her lead from the original Greek meaning that we explored earlier. This Christian symbol will appear as words, things named, events, or actions, quote, by which the prophets often graphically illustrate what they were to preach, as Christ to reveal di divine truth, not only by word, but also by deed. And as the church, through her liturgical acts, gives us matters to understand. The believer, the theologian, thus speaks the word of God through speech, action and deed, and having done unto. And this is, I think, is her great contribution to this debate. For Edith Stein, the Christians become symbols in the deepest sense. What the prophet hears and sees is, as it were, the great school of symbolic theology, 
where images and words become available to the sacred writer so that the unsayable may be said and the invisible made visible. Therefore, we can suggest the symbolic perspective turns the Christian actor into a symbol of God's action in the world. Whether it is the German sisters on their doomed ship, Stein in her filthy cat cattle wagon, or any depressed or lonely person seeking meaning in a meaningless world during the COVID lockdown. These, for the Christians, must all be ways to know God, especially God at the foot of the cross, which are expressed symbolically. In this respect, the artists, poets, musicians and liturgists are, in fact, the keepers of the mystery. For in their symbolic language, as we heard earlier about music, the outward sign of God's action in the world is made manifest. Thus, in her life and eventual horrendous death, Stein, as indeed does Hopkins, becomes the symbol that she so graphically described in her last published essay. So let us turn for the, the, the conclusion of this paper to uh, Hopkins and his poem. To summarize my argument so far, I've used Chenu and Stein both drawing upon Dionysius to argue for a symbolic Christian modality that ushers us into the mystery of human life on earth, especially following Chenu's second law of the symbolic into the brutal suffering at the heart of human existence. Such a modality in common with its Latin medieval origins attempts to hold together the transcendent and imminent poles of human existence often following Chenu, drawing attention to the crudest and darkest aspects of human existence. In Stein's essay, we saw her suggesting how a Christian would ultimately become the symbol, expressed in the symbolic modality as they entered into the passion and death of the highest symbol of all existence, Jesus Christ. So to conclude then, I'd like to suggest that this is exactly what Hopkins is expressing in The Wreck of the Deutschland. What is striking in the poem is that the first third of the poem is not given over to a narrative of the Deutschland's destruction at all. This only begins in the second part at verse 11. Rather, the first 10 verses, part the first, beginning with the opening verse with which we started the paper, are given over to a sort of examination of conscience as Hopkins explores his own Christian perspective on the events he's about to narrate. Um, Dominic mentioned my book on confession. It's, it's like a sort of confession, very Ignatian examine he, he gave. He's, he's preparing himself and I think he's preparing us, the readers, he's putting us in the right frame of mind. He's putting us in the symbolic frame of mind to then encounter the, the terrible events of the wreck. And this first section begins with a fiat, a, ye a saying yes, just like Mary's at the Annunciation, to this reordering of his life around Christ's pattern. I did say yes. O oh, at lightning and lash rod, thou heardest me truer than tongue confess thy terror, O Christ, O God. Thou knowest the walls, altar, an hour, a night, the swoon of a heart that the sweep and the hurl of thee trod, <coughs> hard down with the horror of height, and the midriff a strain with leaning of, laced with a fire of stress. laced with fire of stress. In this second verse, Hopkins introduces one of his personal light motifs, the stress, the pitch, or as he famously calls it, the in-stress of existence. In an early undergraduate essay on Parmenides, 
he had linked the instress of creation with being itself. He wrote there, it, Parmenides' notion of being, means all things are upheld by instress and are meaningless objects without it. The feeling for instress, for the flush and foredrawn, and for inscape is most striking. By being aware of the pitch of existence, the individual can conform themselves to the reality of Christ's presence in all things, as the one he famously says, plays in 10,000 places. This cosmic being, this divine inscape and indwelling, was one of the chief insights Hopkins derived from the British medieval theologian, Duns Scotus, whom he described as of reality, the rarest vein, unraveler. What is exceptional and shown exceptionally in the first part of the wreck is how Hopkins takes this cosmic sense of Christ's presence and personalizes it into our own pitched taste of re reality, reality. As he put it in his commentary on Ignatius's spiritual exercises, for human nature being more highly pitched, selved and distinctive than anything in the world can have been developed, evolved, condensed from the vastness of the world, not anyhow or by the working of common powers, but only by such finer or higher pitch and determination than itself. For nothing else in nature comes near this unspeakable stress of pitch, distinctiveness and selving, this self-being of my own. Nothing explains it or resembles it. Indeed, later on in the commentary, this pitch or stress will explicitly be linked by Hopkins with Scotus's heseitas or thisness. He writes, is this pitch, or whatever we call it then, the same as Scotus's Heseitas? From this pitch, this insight into Christ's presence in reality, comes the fiat, the yes, to the same creative force. I did say yes. Notice a typical Hopkinsian move the shift of the pronoun from the third person plural of the nuns and even the third person singular of Mary at Nazareth to the I, the pitched selving of individual existence with its own taste, he describes as more distinctive than the taste of ale or alum, more distinctive than the smell of walnut or camphor. From this fiat, my personal yes, flows everything else. As we are pitched with the nuns into the dark and distressing destruction of the winter storm off the Kent coast. I kiss my hand to the stars lovely asunder, starlight wafting him out of it and glow glory and thunder. Kiss my hand to the dappled with damson west, since though he is under the world's splendour and wonder, his mystery must be in stress, stressed. For I greet him the days I meet him and bless when I understand. Sorry. Not out of his bliss springs the stress felt nor first from heaven, and few know this, swings the stroke dealt. Stroke and a stress that stars and storms deliver, that guilt is hushed by, hearts are flushed by and melt. But it rides time like riding a river. And here the faithful waver, the faithless fable and miss. The faithless fable and miss. The symbolic presence of Christ is the key, not only to my own existence as a believer, but to all that happens in the world, including its grossest and coarsest destruction, as depicted in this poem. 
for the symbolic interpretation of these events comes through our knowing Christ. It dates from the day of his going in Galilee. Warm laid grave of womb life grey, manger maiden's knee. The dense and the driven passion and frightful sweat. Thence the discharge of it there, it's swelling to be, though felt before, though in high flood yet, what none would have known of it, only the heart being hard at bay. From this symbolic perspective, even the ghastly events off the Kent coast begin to make sense. The poetic representation of the symbolic thus presents for the Christians something of the structure of the universe. As it were, we have an insight into that secret structure of the universe that Valentin mentioned this morning. And God's saving, and yes, loving plan for suffering creation. In this respect then, the winter storms that destroy the Deutschland become the symbolic signifiers for Hopkins' vision of the creator's plan for the creation. The nuns' suffering of the Kent coast becomes the means for the instantization of the grace of God. Surf, snow, river and earth, gnashed, but thou art above, thou Orion of light. Thy unchancelling poising palms were weighing the worth. Thou, martyr master, in thy light sight, Storm flakes were scroll leaved flowers, lily showers sweet, heaven was a strew in them. The nun's suffering thus becomes an insight into the profound truth that lies hidden within ourselves and the world, or as Hopkins calls it in the poem, the ground of being and the granite of it, which is throned behind death with a sovereignty that heeds but hides, bodes but abides, with a mercy that outrides the all of water and arc, for the listener, for the lingerer with a love slide glides lower than death and the dark. So in conclusion, I'd like to suggest that the symbolic ment mentality is at the heart of a Christian view of the world. This is not, as Chenu called it, a psychological game played by an aesthete, even though, I mean, he was French after all. Literary, he says, literary elegance is also involved in this. Rather than an escape from reality, from suffering, a symbolic mode is one that draws us to the granite of being. The profound truth, Chenu says, that lies hidden within the dense substance of things and is revealed by these means. We have explored in this paper another way of seeing reality, a symbolic truth especially open to the discerning eyes and ears of poets, artists, musicians and creators. Such an art, as Chenu calls it, the use of poetic fiction to express intellectual truth, puts poetry in the service of wisdom, of philosophical and theological wisdom. The shorthand for this symbolic form is of course, the cross. The cross for the Christian straddles these two realities of existential despair and eschatological fulfillment. The Christian, as Stein suggests, thus becomes the symbol as they face the cross in an act of faith. As we contemplate the Franciscan nuns or Edith Stein's response to adversity or our own responses to COVID, we are asked to part company with simplistic materialist notions of the self and enter rather into the symbolic world as described by medieval theologians such as Dionysius and Scotus. In this respect, the crisis itself becomes a symbol in the rich sense delineated by Stein in that last work, The Science of the Cross. Here she writes, the crucified one demands from the artist more than a mere portrayal of the picture. 
The crucified one demands that the artist, just as every other person, follows him. That they themselves become the picture of the cross bearer and crucified one and allow themselves to be so transformed. The deepest disasters, including death, are thus transformed from the symbolic perspective into the entrance into the double-natured name, the heaven-flung, heart-fleshed, maiden-filled, miracle in Mary of flame, mid-numbered he in three of the thunder throne. Following this argument, entering into the symbolic, Stein's science of the cross, is thus an invitation to let Christ, in Hopkins' words, Easter in us. So that ultimately he becomes for us, as Hopkins concludes his epic poem, a day spring to the dimness of us be, a crimson cresseted east, a pride rose, prince, hero of us, high priest, our hearts, charities, hearts, fire, our thought, chivalrous throngs, Lord. Thank you. Oh, Lord. Peter, my goodness me, thank you so much. My pleasure. Um, I hope I kept everyone awake after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you, you asked me to be dramatic, uh, Dominic, to keep people awake. <laughs> uh, well, you certainly. I, I channeled my Victorian melodramatist. <laughs> I could learn this and more, and I'm sure other people could too. I must say, I'm interested that people had observed that Christ wasn't present in this morning's talks. I mean, it wasn't a criticism, obviously, it was just an observation. And in a way, I feel that maybe mirrored the loss of Christ in our society, that people feel they can't connect with him anymore. And you, need, you wonder sometimes how much we Christians connect with him. But wisdom prepared the way in the recovery of the symbolic, in daring, as, as you put it at the beginning, to step out of our silos in recognition for needing that. And that maybe where theology has become logocentric in the most debased sense of just word obsessed, argument obsessed, by letting wisdom lead us in to the symbolic, we have encountered the word made flesh and crucified and risen. So thank you so very much. My pleasure. Uh, thank you for, for inviting me to do it. Goodness me. I'll um, probably never do it again. So <laughs> this, is a, this is a unique experience. <laughs> I'm sure you're going to need tea break when it comes. I mean, that would be itself <laughs> a glorious, glorious it was a real. It was a real challenge going into Hopkins. I mean, I did like that, you know, um, Bridges calls it a great dragon. You know, I'd always loved Hopkins but I'd always been a bit frightened of him um, so your invitation forced me to go into it and I'm, I'm glad but <coughs> it was a it was a long and difficult journey it's very courageous and thank you so much I wonder if anybody um, there's about we've got about 10 minutes if anybody has any comments or questions or or thoughts at all for Peter um, You'd just like to raise a hand and hopefully I will see you. Ah, oh, I can see. Uh, Emma's raising a hand from King's College Chapel. <laughs> High up there. <laughs> She's with the angels. <laughs> Emma, yes, please. Um, just make sure I'm not on mute now. Well, Peter, first of all, thank you. I mean, I could have gone on listening forever. A, because I'm totally in love with Hopkins. Hmm. And slightly in love with you. So between <laughs> two, you know, maybe that's too much this information. Is, this is a public forum. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I just loved the way that you were able to put all of that together. And I suppose, well, picking up on, because it's a question I keep being asked both in, in private and in public, um, to, to do some kind of reflection on the, 
the the covid disaster and you know how, how can we how can we cope with it how can we um respond to it as an act of faith um hope and love and i suppose while i'm hugely uh taken by the links you make there um in terms of Edith Stein as well, her response to the disaster that faced her and, and, and how we embrace the cross in these things. We tread a very, very dangerous path, do we not? Between saying these things, which I think are hugely important and uh, to be said about the mystery of suffering and, and our encounter with Christ within our own sense of crucifixion and sounding glib or sounding fatuous about oh well you know suffering we're all with christ and then it's all okay and i suppose i wonder how you both as someone who's doing who's reflecting on this material and also with your your sort of psychology hat on uh, might help us to navigate that very very difficult uh, path between trying to proclaim that very deep truth of union with Christ crucified in our own darknesses and providing an answer from a kind of glib Christianity which so maddens people <laughs> um, when they hear us do it. Mm, well, great, thank you for that. So I've, I counted at least four questions. <laughs> Sorry about I'll, that. I'll go for three of them. So the COVID, um, the uh, trying not to trivialise suffering and um, how we can as a church respond in a meaningful way. Um, well, I'll take those in reverse order. In terms of the how we can respond, I think I sort of made it a clue in, in what I said. Uh, artists, poets and musicians, I think, are going to lead us through this. And um, before the break breakdown, I was going to say, before the lockdown, um, I would often go to art galleries. And I was at a big art exhibition not long ago. And all the people were piling in. And nowadays, when I go to art exhibitions, especially in London, you can't really see much because there's so many people. Hopefully the, with COVID, that won't be the case anymore. But anyway, um, so as a psychologist, I tend to sit back on a bench and watch the people looking at the exhibits. It's far more interesting and you usually see more. And it's, I was watching these people and thinking, they're not actually looking at the pictures. You no, know, they're coming in with a picture or a selfie or whatever. Oh, yeah. and, and they're not actually engaging with the picture. No. So then, so of course, then I was annoyed about that. And then I thought, well, hold on, Peter, let's just follow this through. And then I started watching it more and I thought, they're being drawn by something. You know, it's like they, they don't know why they're here, but they're being drawn by a force. It was like watching pilgrims in a medieval cathedral going to a shrine. And then I thought, you know, this is the role of art and music and poetry and theatre. It's, it's performing this, this religious function. Um, Mark Patrick Hederman, do you know his stuff? The, the, he was the abbot of... Um, oh, Flintstall. Uh, in, in Ireland. He's written some very good stuff on this. I mean, it's not everyone's cup of tea, but... Uh, so that's on, on how we respond. I, I'm going to hand over to the artists and poets on that one. With regards to the COVID, funnily enough, um, I got this quote yesterday. It was given me... Uh, from Cardinal Turkson in Rome. And as you know, uh, Pope Francis has set up a COVID commission. You may well be on it, uh, I don't know. And Cardinal Turkson said, I think this week, he said, the Pope is convinced that we are living through an epochal change. And he's reflecting on what will, will follow the crisis on the economic and social consequences of the pandemic and what we'll have to face and above all, and how the church can offer itself as a safe point of reference to the world lost in the face of an unexpected event. Incredible stuff. Mm. Um, I think watch this space. During lockdown, um, me and my 
large family have amused themselves with a, with a WhatsApp. In fact, I've seen more of my family these last few months than I have for years. So every Sunday we all get together and we've been sharing photos. And I've gone on one of these uh, uh, genealogy sites. So I've, I've sort of made all these contests. It's been absolutely fascinating. And uh, I didn't realise until uh, I did this, I thought, I knew there was some Catholic English Tylers and I knew there were Irish Catholic Tylers. Didn't, couldn't quite work out how they came together. But what I didn't realise is that the Catholic branch, uh, the Irwins, came over with the potato famine in the 1850s. And the more I thought about it, I thought, that's what the COVID is like. You know, initially when COVID started, I thought it was like the HIV AIDS crisis, which of course many of us will remember in the 80s and 90s. Um, but I think this is more like the potato famine. I think it's going to last for years, like the potato famine did, you know, five, six, seven years. And it's going to have huge social and economic uh, repercussions, you know, for, for centuries. I mean, that's, I mean, I'm sitting here because of the potato famine 150 years ago. And looking at the records of my forebears coming to the Midlands at that time, the only help they seemed to get was from the church. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was the church, which was really the only people who, and I know this also from in Liverpool, when I worked in Liverpool, going through the historical records. So I think Pope Francis is right. I think what we respond, you know, remember Pope Gregory the Great. You, I'm sure you read him every night. But Gregory the Great <laughs> said, you know, um, uh, as well as teaching people how to pray and looking after their spiritual needs, we need to look after their material needs. So we do, I think all of us now need to prepare ourselves for this, this great crisis, this potato famine crisis that's going to come on. And then the third thing you said about not to over-spiritualize things, but I think that's why I put emphasis on, I mean, Shenu is, I, I, I know actually very little about the person of Shenu, but his writings, he seems very eccentric and, and quite, theatrical very French you know rather mm. wonderful but um he that second law that I emphasize I think that is the key to the question that you asked there that we uh, don't over spiritualize these things that we find the reality of Christ in the as it were the gross material causes before us and of course Hopkins does that in the poem where mm. he talks about the garroting of the semen and the the terrible uh, death of the nuns. So mm -hmm. thanks, thanks for those three questions. <laughs> My pleasure. And I, and I love you too. Let My pleasure. Okay. The public. <laughs> <Don't call her>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both. Uh, was there a question from Sister Anne? Just wondering. I thought I saw her hand up earlier. No. Yes. The, oh, yes, there, there was. Um, it's. To some extent, I think, um, well, Gemma's question was kind of a reiteration of mine in a way, um, but I suppose it was a slightly, perhaps approached from a slightly different angle. Um, my own research, doctoral research at the moment, is on the relationship between ecclesiology and the mystery of suffering, so very much the idea mm. of how Christian suffering can represent the suffering of Christ in a way that's um, not, as sometimes I think our tradition sadly has encouraged people to think of it in a rather pathological way of, of the kind that, that Gemma was partly alluding to at the beginning of her question. Mm. But I was kind of struck, particularly in, in connection with this, by Peter's reference to um, that interesting moment within a symbolic sensibility when the Christian him or herself becomes a symbol and that's kind of related or at least it, it kind of rang alarm bells in my head or, or you know good alarm bells uh, it's related to an idea I'm kind of wrestling with it which is the idea of a Christian life or the life of a Christian community as a kind of work of religious art in a sense mm -hmm. that um, one of the things that fascinates me about art of the passion, but I think one could also say it about religious art that deals with 
suffering of the body of Christ, as for example, um, the Deutschland is, I think, a, a, a fabulous example of that, is that I know there's a huge debate about this amongst theologians, but it's at least plausible to say that if you paint a beautiful painting of the crucifixion, or if you compose the St. Matthew Passion, uh, or indeed if you write the Wreck of the Deutschland, you're not simply lying. You're not saying that the hideous is not hideous. You're saying that there is a kind of a beauty within that, which, as Gemma says, obviously is a phenomenally kind of knife edge thing to walk, because what one does not want to say is that suffering is beautiful. Um, and I think that the, the key to walking that knife edge responsibly has to be to do what Hopkins himself encourages us to do at the beginning of his last stanza, which is to let Christ Easter in us. In other words, this stuff can only work at all if it's fully Paschal. Mm. If our concentration on um, our representing Christ in his body is a kind of foreshortened Paschal mystery that stops with Good Friday, then, then that's no good. It has to have that kind of onward trajectory to the resurrection and I'm just huge I, I my original academic background is in English literature and as it happens I think the wreck of the Deutschland was the very first poem I wrote an essay on in Oxford so this is kind of <laughs> decades ago so this Took is kind of memory like, lane, yeah. uh, and I'll go back to Hopkins and my supervisor will be really annoyed with me because this is yet another dialogue partner for the thesis where there are already far too many but it just does really, really strike me as being the idea of um, Christian life as symbol, how that relates to the idea of Christian life as, as artistry. And that's, yeah. it's, it's hugely inspired me. So it's a very long and rambling question, but yeah. I wondered whether... Well, let, uh, can I just, um, can I just sort of, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to be another back, backseat supervisor. <laughs> can, I, can I throw in another purse of you to mm. look at? I think the key here is Scotus. Have you, have you read any Scotus? I'm ashamed to say I haven't. I mean, yeah, most, I know don't worry, topic, most people but... haven't. I, I <laughs> haven't really until I prepared for this paper. And in fact, I could have written another paper, perhaps I will one day, on Scotus because um, what Hopkins, I mean, Hopkins, Scotus was, was only just sort of coming into vogue in, at that point in the 19th century. And Hopkins, who'd had a lot of tome, Put yourself on mute, um, Dominic. But uh, Hopkins, I'm a Dominican too, so. <laughs> Hopkins had had all this atomism. It was a bit. He didn't really warm to Thomas. Mm. But then, when he read Scotus, something opened mm. for him. And of course, the poor guy, because of that, they were all Thomists who examined him. He did really badly in his exams mm. because he didn't come out with the Thomist answers they expected. And so that's how he ended up. Um, looking after the poor and in, in the potato famine folk in, in Liverpool and Manchester. Um, but what he got from Scotus is extraordinary. Now, whether we, we, we need to bring in a medieval person at this point, but whether this was Hopkins' interpretation of Scotus or what actually Scotus said, but what he got from Scotus was that, um, which I think you can find in Scotus, that was Christ didn't, the, the incarnation didn't happen because of our sins, you see? The incarnation didn't happen because of Adam. The incarnation would have happened anyway because the love of God was so abundant that the incarnation was going to happen. And I think for your, I don't know what your, where your research is going, but I think if this is the sort of metaphysic that's underlying what, what um, Hopkins is trying to do here. And that could really be very helpful, I think, for your, for your thesis. So good luck with that. I look, I look forward to reading it. <laughs> I'll, be a, I'll be an examiner if you want. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and thanks very much for your paper. That was wonderful. My pleasure. My pleasure. We have gone slightly over, but I think this is very needed discussion. It is so topical. So I'm going to take a last question before the break from Archbishop Kevin. Um, so... Yes, can, can you see and hear me? Oh, indeed, yeah. I've been watching you all day. <laughs> uh, well, uh, I won't delete uh, tea too long, because this is really more of a comment than a question. Thank you very much for your paper, Peter. Uh, I think that one person I think I would add 
to your cloud of witnesses in what you're saying about uh, symbolism would be Etty Hilson. Oh, yes. yes. He was the Jewish woman mm. who had, who died at Auschwitz. She had no formal training in Judaism. Her parents didn't know how to teach her. She never went to the synagogue and had no apparent interest in, in organized religion. And yet, through in and through the experience, she discovers her responsibility for her fellow prisoners. She loves them. She has no resentment at all or anger towards the Germans. And she sees her, she discovers God um, uh, through, through experience. Um, and I think she's a good example. In other words, she is a symbol in her, uh, her journey and her person and the way she emb embraced death at Auschwitz. It's a symbolic in the center which you've been talking about, both for Jews and especially for Christians. Mm. And isn't it, isn't it interesting that the, the three key witnesses in this respect are all women, Edith yeah. Stein, uh, Simone Weil, and Etty Hilsom. There's, there's a wonderful book written about the three of them, but uh, yeah, there's some, something very moving there. Yes, yeah, so it's just that I, I, I immediately, I found myself thinking very much about her as you were talking. Mm. That's all. Thank you. Nice to see you. And you. <laughs> I won't say I love you. I'm very fond of you. <laughs> <laughs> Goodness me. Where is all this going? <laughs> love it. Gracious. <laughs> okay. So, um, before any more heartfelt declarations of love, um, <laughs> Well, that's a good thing. Love one another as I have loved you and all that. <laughs> um, it's now it's 3.22. Can we give ourselves, say, till Ian, are you okay if we start at 20 to 4? And then it would mean we'd yes, finish that's fine. at 10. Is that all right? Thank you. And then, it yep. would, then we'd finish at 10 past 5. We've got half an hour for a plenary at the end, which is a time, obviously, to reflect on the day in general but also maybe to think a little bit about what we might, where we might like to take it from here, what we might like to do for next year's conference, uh, and so on. So uh, do get a cup of tea, and we'll see you back at 20 to 4, 3.40 sharp, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.